Well, I think we're all here. I'm James Dodaire, and I'm a professor of uh, international studies research at the Watson Institute. I want to welcome you all, especially those who just uh, arrived from um, New York. Um, a good chunk of this um, conference was uh, at the International Studies Association meeting, which was held in New York in a, a hotel that was right out of a Goddard film. It was like Alphaville. It was like the windows don't open. There was like the panoptagon. Um, all the elevators were controlled by a centralized computer that never worked. So for all of those who came up from New York, I want to welcome you. I know you're all a little punch drunk, probably like I am. Uh, yeah. Um, this is not the ISA. This is the anti-ISA. You're going to have more than eight minutes to develop a thought. Halfway through a panel, you won't be wondering, what the hell am I doing here? Um, Nisha Shaw and Philippe Bonditi, who are the two uh, postdocs who organized this event, have put together some wonderful, wonderful panels. And um, I think the, the hallmark of Watson, indeed, of, of, of this event, is that um, we use these words you know, somewhat loosely, but um, interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, I prefer supra or superdisciplinarity. But it's also the um, ability to reach across um, generations of thought, um, to um, be supple. Um, one of the strategic reviews we hear, had at Watson was about how we needed to be nimble, because part of our Watson mission is to confront the global condition, the global problems, and find, if not solutions, new ways to think about them, to ask the right questions. And I'm really happy about this event because it is a question. Um, if you look at your program, you will see uh, uh, global security regimes in the making. This is going to be a, uh, uh, an interrogation of global security and the regimes that might um, help us in this current predicament. But it's going to be deeply theorized. Um, and that's another um, aspect and element of the Watson Institute, to have theoretically informed debates, but also to always have a policy uh, orientation, a public engagement, and activism um, at Watson. So when uh, Nisha and Philippe, Philippe came into my office, which happens about like 20 times a day, um, as saying, you know, who can we get for a keynote speaker? Um, you know, we scratched our heads and thinking about it. And we needed someone who had this breadth of thought, um, theoretically informed, had a crossover appeal, someone who's done international relations, but also is a deep thinker. Uh, no, no, just. <laughs> um, and um, so we were, were thinking about it, and then we landed on the perfect person from Johns Hopkins, but she had just taken up her position as chair of Johns Hopkins. So we decided to invite, instead of Jane Bennett, her husband, William E. Conley. Um, so we're very glad um, Bill could come up. Now, uh, tomorrow we're going to have a, a slew of introductions, um, an introduction by um, the interim director of the Watson Institute, David Kennedy, and also Nisha and Philippe, who are going to provide a thematic. So I'm here really to introduce Bill and tell you a little bit about his work before um, we get started. Most of you are familiar about, with his readings and his writings um, in some way or another, so I'm not going to go through the long litany of titles. Um, Bill's at the stage of his career um, where you know, he writes books quite frequently, usually generating one every two years, um, but also books get written about him. This is the um, second of three, The New Pluralism, William Connolly and the Contemporary Global Condition. And in it, um, several writers, um, including um, uh, I think myself and uh, several others uh, talk about Bill's crossover appeal in international relations, David Campbell, obviously, uh, Wendy Brown. Um, and in 1987, I invited Bill, who was one of my, um, I could say, mentor um, colleagues at UMass Amherst, to attend the 1987 uh, Washington International Studies Association meeting, from which we've just escaped. Um, and. Um, it was the double panel that created the book International Intertextual Relations, which was somewhat like uh, Meineke said about Machiavelli's work. Uh, maybe that's overstating it. Um, like uh, uh, plunging a sword into the flank of European thought. Um, long before constructivism was made safe for the discipline of international relations, um, we were trying to bring in continental thinkers. And um, Bill raise the bar. I mean, and that's one of the reasons why Philippe and Nisha and I wanted to have Bill um, sort of kick off this event, is um, to set a high bar um, for how we're going to think about some of these issues. For um, someone who's always 
practiced theory and solved theory as a practice, um, who um, has shown an incredible um, subtlety but also suppleness and going from his sort of 1970s, 1970s post-Marxist Habermasian turn um, to Foucault um, in the 80s, um, Deleuze in the 90s, and then um, subsequently engaging deeply and, and thoroughly with uh, everyone from Augustine to Spinoza, um, Bergson, and, and others. And all the while, many of us felt like we were sort of being left in the dust behind. And some, actually, were somewhat offended by Bill's nimbleness. Um, I had likened it at one point um, to something that happened not very far from here at Newport when Bob Dylan went electric. Uh, uh, <laughs> someone in the audience shouted, traitor. And uh, what did Bob Dylan do? He just played faster, looser, and louder. And I think that's what William Connolly's been doing all his uh, intellectual career. And he's forever young in that regard. So I want to welcome Bill to the podium. Please join me. Um, Thanks, uh, James, for your, uh, your very uh, kind introduction. Uh, I, I hate the word nimble because I was hooked up with this thing. Uh, and. Uh, I could easily fall over it at, at, any, uh, at any time, uh, but uh, uh, I, I am uh, very pleased to be at the Watson Center. I'm really looking forward to this conference. I have a lot of things to learn about the topic at hand, uh, and I, I also remember that little moment in 1987 because what I saw at that ISA conference was a little band of warriors. Uh, James was in it, and... Larry was and uh, Rob Walker and, and others and and trying to create a little space and when I came back a few years later it was the space uh, I don't know if that's still the case but uh, but uh, it was and so they they really uh, they really produced something uh, and uh, we're all indebted to them for it uh, so this is um, the the presentation is is to be the last chapter in a forthcoming book to be uh, entitled a world of becoming and the previous chapters cover things such as the need for uh, shock therapy and in intellectual life uh, and what becoming means and how it challenges both te uh, neo-Kantian and teleological theories of, of time, causality, ethics, belonging, and politics. Uh, and, um, and so here, this last chapter uh, uh, speaks more to the global condition. It, it's called Capital Flow, Sovereign Decisions, and world resonance machines. The first section is called a, a Civil Society and its Rabble. Civil Society, says Hegel in his magisterial study, is a modern civilizational advance that encourages a high degree of self-reliance, creative enterprise, and self-responsibility among its male participants. Its impersonal capacities of self-regulation lifted above every previous mode of coordination. Unfortunately, however, it also contains inveterate tendencies to overreach itself, to spawn forces that uh, break its equilibrium, and to resist or subvert the internalization of state norms and directives that could lift, lift its balances to a higher level. These irrational tendencies are expressed in the overspecialization of work uh, that narrows the horizons of laborers, in the expansion of consumption needs that accompany the wrenching of people from traditional life, and in entrepreneurial hubris that arises when the market virtue of self-reliance becomes too inflated. We've encountered that recently. One, of, one effect of these excesses is not only the production of poverty, but the transduction of the poor, Hegel says, into a new historical constellation he calls a rabble. Hegel's presentation of the rabble deserves quotation. Quote, in this condition of poverty, they are left without the needs of civil society. I'm sorry, they're left with the needs of civil society. And yet, since civil society has at the same time taken from them the natural means of acquisition, they are deprived of all the advantages of society, such as the ability to acquire skills and education in general. Poverty in itself does not reduce people to a rabble. A rabble is created only by the disposition associated with poverty 
by inward rebellion against the rich, against society, against government, etc. The important question of how poverty can be remedied is one which agitates and torments modern societies especially. End of quote. This um, question agitates modern life because the demand for self-reliance and the high consumption need generated by civil society sow resentment against the market state regime among those who are held responsible to some extent by themselves and to a great extent by others for not meeting those two conditions. I do not accept the term rabble that Hegel deploys with its own tendency to condemn the constituencies whose suffering and volatile resentments he seeks to identify. But I do underline the way in which the new thresholds of agency, education, skill, and consumption needed to participate in this new world combine with the experience of impoverishment to exacerbate disaffection and resentment among the poor. Today, the destructive relation between civil society, civil religion, and existential resentment is no longer confined to those in positions of poverty. It circulates more widely, both within capitalist states and between regime, uh, regions tied together by e uneven economic change, political power, and rapid communi uh, media communication. Such resentments can be propelled in a variety of directions. Um, as the imbalances in civil society develop, Hegel sees, pressure grows for external colonization to secure raw materials, to relieve problems of overproduction and underconsumption, and to bring the virtues of civil society in the modern state to virginal territory. The sea provides a gift from providence for colonizing effort, efforts, offering capitalists smooth space upon which to travel and creating protective distance between them and colonized regions. Those, the open space Hegel celebrated is retained, but the protective function it performed for um, imperial powers has dissolved. What though enables specific states and the world historical state eventually spawned by them to be wise? The world historical state is critical for Hegel and for a lot of theories of international relations. Um, what does it? Well, it is Geist finding variable expression in the institutions of economic, familial, religious, and state life. Geist is always in play, below, below the surface of attention in Hegel's version of the world. It becomes most visible, however, in the world historical state that faces no higher earth, earthly sovereign above it. Everything else does, as it regulates the world economy and world relations. Here, for the, for, for the world historical state, the higher praetor is a quote, this is a quote, is simply the universal spirit, which is being in and for itself. It is, i.e., the world spirit, end of quote. So what happens if you accept elements in Hegel's description of 19th century civil society, the state and expansive capital, while casting off the ontology of Geist in which it is set? What happens if, moreover, you conclude that, the, that numerous mediating processes and institutions he cites, he's very thorough, gender subordination, the heterosexual family, the three estates, economic markets, the police, uh, the state colonization, international law, and the world historical state. Uh, what happens if they are even more ambiguous than he, than he imagined? They can impose internal and external constraints on capital and states, but they can also become inflamed with the very energies Hegel expected them to regulate and modulate. Adopting such a strategy, thinking through and beyond Hegelian interconnections, and especially his notion of institutional interpenetration, without the theophilosophy of Geist, we may discern in the 19th century seeds of a contemporary global condition that exceeds the control of any market, system, state, or network of states. Just to anticipate, that's what I think Deleuze and Guattari actually do. They are Hegel without Geist, which means a lot of things. <clears throat> now, to get to the meat of this paper, I'm going to uh, 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 skip over a couple of sections to get to the issues that I think are, are cru crucial for us today. 
uh, giving just a, a bare summary of, of, of each and sufficient, I hope, to set up the last two sections. So the next section is called The Global Character of Capitalism, and it, and it tries to create an encounter between Hegel and Immanuel Wallerstein. So Wallerstein shows how capitalism is cross-state from the start. It doesn't, doesn't have to go to colonization to start that. Uh, uh, how it is anchored in uneven regional exchange from the start, uh, and how a robust state is indispensable to capitalism, even though the most confident defenders of it always want or purport to want to reduce the size and scope of the state. But Wallerstein, while uh, making valuable amendments to Hegel, fails to come to terms with the expressive dimensions of capitalism and, state, and the state. And that's where Hegel's genius uh, continues to shine, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and uh, and, and therefore fails to come to terms, I think, with a cross-regional mode of antagonism that recalls some elements in Hegel's idea of the rabble. But now it becomes a cross-regional antagonisms. Uh, in the changing face of sovereignty, I try to show how the practices of sovereignties become contracted in scope and intensified in power as the globalization of capital and religious struggle proceed together. And I draw on a tacit distinction in Hegel between decisional sovereignty and expressive sovereignty. Expressive sovereignty is the important one. The decisional sovereign for Hegel merely dots the I's and crosses the T's of, re of issues relayed to it. More fundamental is the expressive dimension of sovereignty. It consists of pervasive tendencies and exp expectations, institutional interpenetrations, which, because they infuse the state, markets, family, church, occupational organization, uh, civil servants, and the relations between them, set both the larger uh, conscious context of legitimate decision and the unconscious background of the thinkable, the unconscious background of the thinkable, thinkable expressive sovereignty. The expressive dimension of sovereignty is the, is the dimension that Hegel infuses with Geist. I want that, pull Geist out of it. It's not that easy. Uh, so um, I retain Hegel's insight into the importance of interpenetration, uh, I think his favorite word really, between institutions and expressive sovereignty while dropping the faith that, is, that what is expressed always conduces to the welfare of the state and the interstate system. Expressive sovereignty on this reading filters into both market performance and sovereign decisions by promoting specific terms of exchange preliminary definitions of friends and enemies, the shape of state-non-state non -state relations, the tone and place of religion in public life, the role of the family in ethical life, and so forth. The so forth is the most important. It does not, however, automatically exude a higher rationality. A state composed of military, capitalists, and religious fanatics inflaming one another can be expressive and destructive at the same time. That which is expressive in the sense used here could support the future of capitalism, decrease asymmetrical exchanges with other regions, respond positively to the veritable minoritization of the world taking place at a more rapid pace before our very eyes, the minoritization of the world, an awkward phrase for an important phenomenon, uh, reverse the effects uh, that interstate capitalism has on global warming, but it can also point in the opposite direction on each count, toward modes of investment and consumption that intensify climate warming and resource depletion, toward asymmetrical modes of regional exchange that inflame resentments by those on the wrong side of these equations, toward bellicose military policies to preserve regional advantages and punish new minorities within the region, toward pronouncements of Christian or Islamic civilizational superiority that further activate resentments, and so on. Expressive sovereignty is a powerful force. Its connection to worldly wisdom, however, is to be assessed rather than presupposed. Okay, well now we skip altogether the, the Foucauldian, uh, the, the Foucauldian uh, Deleuzian discussion of how sovereignty uh, morphs into societies of control and so forth, but I think that th that that's fair enough. People, uh, uh, everybody in this room understands that, and that's my guess. So I, I come to the last two sections. 
Uh, the, last, the next to last section is called A Global Antagonism Machine. We need to explore an emergent formation that draws several of these elements into a larger network of antagonistic forces. To do so, it is necessary to induce, introduce one more concept with apologies to Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari. An abstract machine is a cluster of energized elements of multiple types that enter into loose reinforcing conjugations as the whole complex moves, as it acquires significant mobility. It is an abstract machine more than a stable configuration because of its mobility, the element of instability between its interacting elements, its relative openness to outside forces, and its uncertain capacity to morph into something new. The elements that compose such a machine impinge upon one another to some degree, infiltrate each other to an extent, that's the Hegelian interpenetration, uh, and exceed both relationships to a degree, becoming loose, fluctuating forces that might be colonized in new ways. In impingement, infiltration, uh, relatively loose elements. That's the kind of complex causality you need to engage a, uh, an abstract machine. A lava flow constitutes a simple abstract machine. The flow of uh, molten lava, the melted rocks of different types carried by the flow, the uneven terrain over which it, uh, over which it moves, the differential cooling rates of, uh, of each type of rock when the lava meets water and open air. Each lava flow congeals into a granite formation, the pattern of which is not predictable in advance. That's why people don't like those three elements of causality, because it takes away predictability. Similarly, warm water in the Caribbean, a wide expanse of sea, and fluctuating winds can co coalesce into the abstract machine of a hurricane. At a certain tipping point, the heterogeneous elements enter into a spiral of self-amplifications, creating a hurricane whose direct, exact direction, scope, and intensity can baffle the humans tracking it. Finally, the dynamic assemblage between a species, a gene pool, a rapid shift in milieu, and the entry of new predators also composes an abstract machine of species evolution, kind of uh, accentuating the pace of, of evolution at a particular moment. As far as I can tell, evolutionary biologists are unable to predict with confidence when the next species will emerge and what shape it will assume. Quoting from the authors of this notion, I thought I should give them one quote. Uh, quote, as a general rule, an assemblage is all the closer to an abstract machine, the more lines without contour passing between things it has, and the more it enjoys the powers of metamorphosis. The powers of metamorphosis. An abstract machine is thus composed of multiple elements, some of which were hanging loose before its formation others of which were part of a machine that has since dissolved or been overwhelmed. No central agents, agent controls an abstract machine. Its rate of movement is relatively fast, a lava flow, but not a congealed slab of granite. It periodically enters into new conjunctions with other systems in motion, open systems in motion. Its flows contain an uncertain degree of pluripotentiality, and it generates patterns of behavior with a degree of unpredictability. It is abstract because it is self-organizing to a significant degree. Because its dynamism challenges or exceeds the control of the humans entangled in it. And because it is susceptible to changes through the intersection between new infusions from the outside and its creative responses to them. Consider the global market in derivatives that grew at an explosive rate between uh, 1973 and 2008. At its peak, it provided speculators with over a trillion dollars to make rapid hedge bets in, on interest rates, mortgages, and exchange rate differentials, often taking advantage of the slower and more regulated activities governing states, international organizations, and traditional banks. Its bets began to focus on those domains much more than on traditional futures and options tied to hogs, wheat, oil, and corn. Its explosion onto the world scene as an abstract machine 
depended upon uneven regional exchanges, lightning fast instruments of global exchange, expansion of the class of, of speculators, differential transaction speeds, ideological sec success within and between states or above states to stifle market regulation, and boosting by the media and international economic agencies. I work out to the Kudlow report every afternoon. Once this machine became organized, it tested the capacities of control by any hegemonic state or international organization. Most agents in it believed that they could quantify and assess comparative risk probabilities, but the rapid assumptions they must make about the prospects of regime stability, uh, uh, intersections with natural processes, uh, the reliability of resource bases, and the transparency of other participants means that the volatile system is replete with objective uncertainty, not risk, objective uncertainty. The volatile character of this global system has helped to destabilize the economies of several countries, including Thailand, Turkey, and Brazil. Uh, and I won't, I won't go on uh, because I, I wrote this in, in September, uh, and I've got other things penciled in here about the last few weeks, but I, I, don't, uh, I don't need to say that. Uh, but, um, uh, th th this, is, uh, an th this is an abstract machine, and many people uh, in, in the academy said uh, that it was extremely dangerous. So no matter what we've heard elsewhere, this is uh, exactly how the dangers would emerge is one question. That, uh, that the dangers were great is something that many people saw. I am most interested, however, in the emergence of another global machine connected to this one, as it draws diverse market, sovereign, and spiritual energies into its fold. It might be called a resonance machine of global antagonisms. In this nearly global machine, dissonant forces, drawing upon competition between states, resentments tied to uneven economic exchange uh, and abstract speculative practices, and the more intense visibility of, of regional distribution of dominant religious institutions becomes carried into a, re a resonance machine of cross-regional extra-state antagonisms. The suffer angering, I'm sorry, the suffering anger and resentments Hegel identified with an enclosed rabble now becomes distributed, if unevenly, a much of, across a much broader space. These reactions activate significant minorities in different regions, help, helping to mobilize them into an ab, a, abstract machine of mutual antagonisms. The elements which, from which the machine uh, becomes self-organized include loose energies of resistance and resentment released by the collapse of the Cold War, a world roughly divided into regionally based religions with minorities distributed in each area, Uneven economic exchange be between regions that correlate loosely with the distribution of religion, religious differences. Extreme dependence upon, by uh, hegemonic states upon supplies of oil located outside their territorial boundaries. The rise of a world derivative system that paces the fate of numerous constituencies and states in its hands without enabling them to identify agents of accountability for that fate. The accentuated role of mass media in most regions and across them, and simmering anxieties and resentments by many at diverse sites in this machine about the place of mortality and time in the human condition. Tensions and injustice accumulated from multiple sources condense into a global machine of revenge and counter-revenge with no, with no central controlling uh, agents. The machine does not exhaust all the spaces and actions it occupies. Rather, it, inf it, it, it forms an aspect of them in the way that participants in a single state can be divided by class without the class composition exhausting everything about them. That's a, an important part of this thesis. This machine, organized in the interstices of regional markets, religious energies, and sovereign practices, exposes one way in which there is always an outside to decisional sovereignty, to global markets, and to expressive sovereignty. 
Um, in this case, the outside lifts, as it were, the expressive dimension char charted by Hegel within states to a global level, showing us again that the expressive dimension can be both real and profoundly destructive in shape. Other dimensions of the side outside, such as climate change, resource availability, and unruly cosmic forces, will not be engaged here. They are engaged in the book, but they won't be engaged here. The various components of this machine, once in place, can inflame and intensify one another. Global market priorities that create new modes of suffering and weaken specific regimes. Suicide bombings that intensify religious or territorial resentments. Provocative declarations about the intrinsic inferiority of this or that creed. New territorial claims. Rogue settlements in occupied territories. Tactical defilement of sacred sites. Provocative cartoons. Nuclear proliferation. New territorial walls. Collective rapes. Preemptive wars, sovereign bombing campaigns, state torture, and so on exacerbate this world antagonism machine once it has required its own momentum, its own shape, its own uh, form, propelling it in directions that sometimes surprise the parties involved. This, uh, I want to call this the consummate anti-cosmopolitan global machine. This global machine expresses and amplifies resentments about human mortality, uh, different senses of enti regional entitlement, and abo uh, perhaps uh, above all, uh, resentment about the veritable minoritization of territorial state regimes taking face place at a faster pace uh, than heretofore before our very eyes. The latter, ironically, is largely a product of the global expansion of capital of uneven market shares, new strategies of border crossing, and the enhanced role that the media play in and across regions. The media often functioned like a hot sea, lifting a tropical storm into a hurricane. The drive to take revenge against the new visibility or new degree of visibility of other creeds that exas exacerbate the vague sense of uncertainty you feel about your own is not primarily an individual or private phenomenon. This was the mistake of secularism, which pretended that faith was, or could be, confined to private realm. Just leave that behind. As drives to existential revenge are amplified by the global antagonism machine, they slide back into zones of institutional life, into media practices, voting patterns, family life, military priorities, investment decisions, career aspirations, consumption demands, patriotic fervor, religious articulations, and the interactions between them. That is to say, the expressive dimension of cultural life, which Hegel sought heroically to enclose within Geist, states in a world historical state, now exceeds all of them. Well, the world historical resonance machine that we are barely sketching could morph into a new one, just as the Cold War Morphed, in, morphed into this one during a rather short uh, phase transition. I'm still looking for the people who predicted that phase transition. China or India could replace current hegemonic states, introducing new pressures and priorities into the world and slicing up the machine. Resource and climate crises could generate new preemptive actions by Western states or close them out of needed oil supplies and foreign credit. New social movements in Muslim countries uh, could open alliances with constituencies in several Euro-American Euro states. A new global plague, transmitted by the rapid modes of transit that grease the world capitalist system, could dry up preemptive wars and insurgent responses. Or several of these could coalesce in a surprising way. So what is the advantage of thinking these conflicts in terms of a mobile machine that includes absorbs and exceeds multiple agents of various sorts. I'm not entirely sure. But it might encourage modesty in state and or capital-centered assumptions, state, military, and or capital-centered assumptions about how to relate to the new world. And it also might encourage us how to think about how to intervene more creatively at more numerous points in this machine. 
there would be no guarantee of success in these strategies of intervention, for example. That was lost when the theme of Geist was replaced, when the compensatory idea of a self-equilibrating world market was blown sky high again, and when an outside to both sovereignty and world markets has finally been acknowledged more fully. So the last section uh, is, is brief, and it's called, uh, it, it's a question mark, it's called counter-movements. During the early stages of Christendom, dissident monks and priests formed collectives in the desert or inserted themselves as moles in the church hierarchy or formed new orders that pressed upon the hierarchy. Peasants could cross themselves on Sunday, pay their tithes, and avoid the authorities at many other uh, junctures. Upon the consolidation of capitalism in the modern state, state revolution seemed to set one possibility of positive change, electoral takeovers another. During the 1960s and 70s in Europe and the United States, protests and strikes took aim at both state and institutions of civil society, both together micropolitics and macropolitics. And today in the United States at least, an evangelical capitalist resonance machine enters into the institutions of civil society such as churches, investment activity, media financial reports, um, families, associations, consumption practices, corporate boards, schools, etc. Although it is finally being challenged at several of those points. What are the possible modes of positive inter intervention then into this new global resonance machine. Certainly state and interstate pressure to regulate derivatives markets, to roll back Israeli settlements, to promote a new state of Palestine, Palestine or even a larger pluralistic Israel would help immeasurably. So would the end of preemptive wars, torture and the bellicose image the United States has presented to the world. But these and other actions are not even apt to emerge on their own, in my view, uh, 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 because they uh, require significant constituency changes on the ground to make them f feasible. And besides that, more than them is needed. A combination of luck, exhaustion of the most militant constituencies on each side, cultural shaming, and creative action by non-state actors within and across states is also needed to turn the machine in a new direction. So here I will only focus on the last item, one, the one dimension, a, a triggering force that may carry Hegel's expressive dimension of sovereignty into contemporary role definitions with a global presence. It is misleading to divide the political world into individuals, constituency organizations, states, and international organizations. Each individual, for instance, is ensconced in a variety of roles, and each role connects larger assemblages together within and across states in both conscious and unconscious ways. A role is neither entirely reducible to the individuals who inhabit it, habit it nor thoroughly assimilable to the larger assemblages that enable and c constrain and manage it. It is this uh, it is thus the site of a strategic ambiguity. Roles are sites of strategic ambiguity, ambiguity, potentially susceptible for that reason to creative political de redeployment on the ground. To consider multiple roles in relation to this global resonance machine suggests how accumulated changes in these practices might contribute to turning the machine in a different direction. Certainly a large number of preachers, imams, rabbis, writers, military leaders, media talking heads, unemployed workers uh, introduced earlier changes into role conduct that helped to organize, that played a role in the organization of this current machine. The trick today is to infuse a bit of the warrior ethic into the performance of several roles, not in the spirit of Napoleon, Putin, and Bush, but in that of Gandhi, Thoreau, Nietzsche, and Martin Luther King, with the inspiration and strategic sense of each adjusted to new circumstances of being. The goals in ascending order are first to induce uh, cumulative changes in role conducts that shift the character of expressive practices 
and encourage others to do so. Second, to nudge collective role assemblages in new directions. And third, to inspire from this base new cross-state social movements, drawing energy from uh, activity on these first two fronts to impose both internal and external pressures upon corporations, states, universities, churches, temples, investment firms, the media, the internet, and international organizations. The initial possibilities are, are numerous. Consumers can, as the need and opportunity arises, alter patterns of consumption with respect uh, to food their own food production, food acquisition, vehicle use, housing, cuisine, clothing, and entertainment, seeking to gear each mode more closely to a near future that reduces oil dependence, improves food production, curtails emissions, and seeking to, to expire by example more widespread and intense support for collective modes of consumption that reduce inequality within and between regions. Investors and participants in retirement investment funds can readjust the priorities of their investments as they also organize to demand closer regulation of volatile markets. Congregants within churches, temples, synagogues, mosques, and madrasa can denounce the most ugly pronouncements and actions taken by others in the name of their creed to shame those who have hijacked their creed for retrograde means and, and to withdraw uh, tolerance from them. They can also uh, press their own congregations to alter their energy use, relations with other creeds, and relations to corporations and the state. Doing so, they also help to recompose the connection between existential faith and, uh, and those uh, cross-creedal drives to abstract revenge that have a certain prominence today in so many areas. Those with ec expertise in oil exploration, sustainable energy production, electrical engineering, and car production can experiment with new modes of transportation and energy use. Writers, TV producers, actors, bloggers, and film directors can infuse a gratitude for existence itself more actively into their writing, films, and characters to inspire it in others too and to challenge those cynical existential dispositions that even the left too often exudes. Veterans who have experienced the horror of war up close can communicate that sense to others while publicizing non-military ways to engage contemporary issues. Reporters and dissident economists can publicize microeconomic experience in various corners of the world that could be extended elsewhere exposing investors, consumers, and producers to a larger range of possibilities than generally recognized. Teachers in schools and universities can teach students how the media work upon them daily at multiple levels of the sensorium and how they too can acquire uh, sophisticated media skills. You can't eliminate the effects on the sensorium. I take it that the Watson Center is doing that. The point of self and group experimentation with role assignments is simultaneously to make a direct difference through our conducts, to open us to new experiences that might alter our, rela our own relational sensibilities further, to scramble fixed role assumptions assumed by others, to form operational connections from which larger political movements might be generated, and to make make connections with role warriors in other regions so as to enlarge the space and public visibility of positive citizen action. Stated changes in constituency belief are never enough, since the layered embodiment of belief and the actual performance of roles are so closely bound together. Hegel's interpenetration. A belief is an embodied tendency to performance. Concerted shifts in role performance help to change embodied beliefs. And the accumulation of belief role changes exert pressure on, uh, on larger constellations. Effective role adventurism builds a reservoir of public readiness for more militant adventurism and more positive state and interstate actions. Uh, If and when such a counter machine becomes organized, each pressure point would begin to resonate with the others, 
creating a positive resonance machine larger than the parts from which it is composed. If you don't think it can be done, you have to look at the negative resonance machines that have so much presence in the world today. Again, none of these interventions alone, nor all in concert, could suffice to redirect the new uh, global resonance machine. Luck and pregnant points of contact with changes in state actions, the policy of international organizations, creative market innovations, and religious organization are definitely needed. But these larger constellations also cannot move far unless they meet multiple constituencies primed by their own role behavior to join them, and especially ready to press them when they lapse into inertia, as they always do. If the world antagonism machine of revenge and counter-revenge stretches, twists, and constrains sovereign units, regionally anchored creeds, uneven capitalist uh, markets of exchange, and international organizations, while drawing selective sustenance from elements in them, a counter-machine must do the same thing. All right, well, thank you very much. I hope I haven't uh, taken too much time. Get this uh, counter resonance machine kicking here with some questions and comments. Who feels brave enough to pose the first question? Yes, sir, in the back. I was quite taken by the Deleuzean metaphor machine, but I was wondering if it doesn't make the world more fluid than it is uh, at the moment. But I, you know, as you were speaking and you were bringing together uh, religion, the internet, uh, and stuff like that. I mean, these were interesting combinations. <clears throat> what it made me think of uh, was the process of hybrids in, in language, as opposed to a standard language. And uh, even though we are always producing hybrids uh, as people move around the world, uh, a lot of these hybrids tend to be temporary. Temporary formations but the standard languages still persist. And uh, as you were moving so dazzlingly across the globe, I was wondering whether or not, uh, you know, sovereign states, nations, superpowers, uh, are not a little bit more stable, that they may, not, they may be around, uh, you know, significantly longer than the fluidity in your analysis suggests? I don't think that sovereign states uh, are likely to disappear. I think sovereignty has intensified with the globalization of so many domains of life, uh, and, and uh, that, that, it's, uh, that, that sovereign states are, are very important actors. But that doesn't mean that there isn't, uh, that there, isn't uh, there aren't things outside and beyond sovereignty. To say that sovereign states are, are, uh, are profoundly important is not to say that their own role hasn't shifted significantly with respect to their, so that would be the discussion of the disciplinary apparatus that sovereign states have been imposing for a few decades, what you, call, what you might call control societies. Uh, and so, so this, this idea of a, of, a, uh, of a global resonance machine uh, uh, thinks of uh, that uh, these these the sovereign states, global markets, uh, uh, religious creeds, and so forth, as both having a profound, uh, relatively stable presence of their own, and in various ways feeding into a machine uh, that uh, th that doesn't rule them, but they don't quite rule it either. Uh, so, so uh, this is not a world of uh, of full fluency. Uh, it's a world in which. Uh, uh, you, you go through periods in, in this zone or that zone of uh, relative equilibrium, and then you go through periods of rapid disequilibrium, which always surprises all social scientists. Uh, and it surprises everybody in terms of what it, where it comes and how it's going to go and so forth. But uh, so this is not a, a, a world, this is not a picture which says, well, you used to think that things persist. Uh, that human beings have bodies, but they're, instead, you know, but they're floating. It's not anything like that. But a lot of people tend to hear it the first time uh, they encounter it th this way, and I and I think it's I, I, I think it's because uh, 
maybe there's a hesitancy uh, to think that these stable forms might not have a profound potential instabilities in them. We could be on the verge of a world depression that, that very few people uh, predicted before, and it could have profound changes in, uh, in, in the, the effects on the world. So you'd have relatively stable states and then a, then a, then a, then a significant shift. Uh, the, uh, it, it's very hard for me to find the scholars uh, 10 years before the fact who predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and and it's, it was a very solid regime. Uh, so I think that different zones go through periods of equilibrium and then disequilibrium. And I think that the elements of disequilibrium, which is maybe the part of this vision that's not very pleasing, could come from anywhere. <coughs> could come from anywhere. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so, so I don't think that the world is just fluent. That's not my conception. Uh, and, and I also appreciate what you're comment about hybrid languages and so forth. And it is kind of interesting to read about uh, how English itself uh, is a is a composite of multiple uh, languages, uh, and and how and how those modes have shaped and come into this this language and so forth. Uh, so uh, I thank you uh, for your point, but the the. This is not a theme that state sovereignty disappears, not, not in slice. Thanks a lot. You said at the beginning that um, this was very much an attempt to think against linear teleological time. So I started to think about, well, what is the temporality of, of the machine, if you want? And uh, I was particularly interested in everything you said about the possibility of making interventions in the, in the machine possibility of some sort of transformation through the machine. So I wanted to ask, what's the temporality of those interventions? What do they look like? Can you help us think about the momentariness of those moments? If you like? So uh, a metamorphosis machine uh, uh, it, it is a machine that, that might, uh, uh, as, it, as it acquires momentum and so forth, it might, uh, it might take a twist and turn that kind of uh, is very much at odds with the, with the expected trajectory. I think about the, about the collapse of Marxism in various places and its replacement over a very short period of time. Uh, and, uh, or, or you could think about the, the, the emergence of the 60s in Europe and the United States and its collapse in a very short, uh, emergence in a short period of time? collapse in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and so uh, the uh, uh, when uh, from my point of view you have to have a, you have to have a double take on time. Uh, in, in everyday life you cannot <coughs> avoid operating without a linear conception of time. Bergson claims that is built right into the modes of perception that allow me to pick up this glass and hopefully not to stumble over this cord when I'm talking. Uh, and, and so that's an indispensable part, but it, it may be a bad way, uh, it may be a bad starting point to think about time, particularly during periods of accentuated disequilibrium in this or that zone. So, so um, uh, uh, capitalism acquired some of the characteristics of a metamorphosis machine when it started interacting with the climate. Now I'd like to, I'd like to know of an economist, Marxist, uh, a neoliberal, or, uh, or Keynesian in the 1940s who was thinking about the effects of capitalism on climate and the effects of climate on capitalism. Uh, th this is something new being brought into the world. Uh, and and uh, and if I were to continue down this line, I, I, in this paper, I would have, I would have to think about well, you know, does 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 the resentment of this intersection between capital and climate change does it have something to do with the existential resentments that come from the European and uh, American side of this antagonism machine? Because I think it does. I think there is a. There, there are new experiences of time that are available to, to us today, and I think that in some sectors there's a profound resentment of those experiences and a desire to turn them back. So that would be that, that, that so that would be a kind of a metamorphosis. So well, where do you intervene on that? Okay, well, because that's what you were thinking about. Well, where do you intervene on that? The intervention there is 
first of all, to try to kind of stage the encounters, to get people... Uh, is it okay to walk away from this thing? Yeah. Uh, it's a, I'm, I'm coming up there. Uh, it, it, uh, the, the, uh, to get people... Uh, to stage the encounters, to get people to see what their own ex experiences are that are changing their operational notions of time, and then to see how some people are responding with resentment to that, and some people are responding with, with uh, trying to work with it and so forth, and that this is an in ineliminable issue at this historic juncture. Uh, and then you, uh, and I think it's involved in this world resonance machine, even though I haven't uh, pursued that in this presentation. So, um, so then, well, intervention. Well, the, the, the role, uh, the, the role experimentation uh, that, that I'm talking about here is, is, uh, is, a, is one of the possible modes of intervention because, because roles are more entangled with each other in a more global economy, uh, in, a, in more immediate ways. They make, a, they make more of a difference to each other. And if you believe, as I do, that one of the phenomena of our time that hasn't been emphasized enough, but is having a profound effect on everybody's reactions and thinking, if you believe that the minoritization of the world is occurring at a more rapid pace today, then, then uh, coming to terms with that phenomenon. Uh, so you, so you, kind of, you have to kind of articulate it, and then you have to think about strategies to work on it, and strategies to work on ourselves about it. Uh, because, because nobody is and no constituency is immune to existential resentment. And existential resentment plays a role. I'm a left Nietzschean philosophy of becoming, and existential resentment plays a role in these, in, during these periods of accentuated disequilibrium. That was, that's just some thoughts uh, that might, might speak to your, your point. I had a question about where the, the grounding for the kind of normative principles that you seem to lay out, or at least the programmatic aspects of the talk, come from. Uh, there was a suggestion about you know it, it's not possible to kind of, to to offer a, a global pro programmatic answer to things. It's not possible to see in your view a direction to history the way 19th century theorists like Hegel and Marx thought. But you could do these little things. But even those little recommendations, right, have to have some kind of basis in, in it, or some normative basis. So that, that's my kind of big question. And more specifically, I'm wondering whether you lose um, at least some of the, 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 the way that uh, normative claims and world historical analysis intersect in the 19th century by abandoning, you know, abandoning teleology. So in Hegel and in Marx, um, there's a glo global story about the direction that history is moving. But precisely because there's a story about where we're moving, that's where the normative claims come in. We make the normative claims in order to get us towards that direction. But you've abandoned the teleology, so where, what's the kind of basis for the normative claims? One of the anxieties uh, that stands in the way of rethinking our own experiences of time is the notion, most brilliantly propounded by Kant, that uh, unless you expect, accept a progressive image of time, in which there's never a break in progress. It might be slow and it might be faster, but there's never a break in progress. Unless you accept that, you can't have a moral image. And a lot of people think that. So, so if I think that we have these new experiences of time, that they find expression in this global machine and so forth, uh, and uh, it's, uh, I, I have to show people like you, and I'm very patient about it, I have to show people like you that, uh, that you are committed to one notion of morality and ethics in which it's derived from a stable principle, uh, and, and, and it, it has a certain kind of proof quality to it. Uh, and in the, in, the, in the clearest version by Kant, uh, we have this apodic experience that morality takes the form of law, and then we move from there. But billions of people in the world don't have that ex apodictic experience. They're not Kantians. Uh, and that's, that's not a central feature of Buddhism and other, uh, other orientations, and neither is it a central feature of imminent naturalism. So we don't try, that's what I am, and so we don't try to derive our ethics from certain indubitable experiences. We try to cultivate care for this world and, find, and, and allow it to find expression in our, in our various modes of uh, activity. And that's why working on roles and beliefs at the same time is part of the story. So we, don't, we, don't, we advance an ethic of cultivation, not a morality of command, not a juridical morality. And we don't expect other people 
to all buy it, but we think they should pay attention to it and, and understand that this monopoly story on how morality functions ain't holding up and that some people will accept it and others won't, but it's essentially contestable. Essentially contestable. And to come to terms with its essentially contestable contestability without resenting its essential contestability is part of the process of coming to terms with multiple sources and groundings of ethics in the world we inhabit without resenting that multiplicity. It's, it's part of coming to terms with the minoritization of the world that's taking place. So, I, I really appreciate your question because I think that's the first question that comes when someone is presenting a notion of time that doesn't accept either the, the teleological notion of Hegel in some ways, of Marx in other ways, and also the, the kind of this, the necessity of subjective teleology of Kant. That's the core. And I don't accept any of them. I don't accept any of them. Uh, and, and, and I acknowledge that my notion of time is contestable, uh, but uh, yours, to, it, yours is too, baby. Uh, and that's, <laughs> that's the acknowledgment that I haven't seen coming so much. Uh, yeah. So then what is, the, what is the meaning then of the normative claims that come at the end of the talk? Is it meant to just be a description of what you'll do or what people will do in moments in time? Or is it meant to be a cross-cultural or at least intracultural claim about what we should do. So take, for instance, the claim about stock, you know, investing in stocks in a certain way. Sure. I take it that's not just, you're not just describing your portfolio, you're suggesting what people <clears throat> should do, period. Right. So right. where does that get its bite if, right. if we go so local, as you suggest? No, you don't go so local, uh, but, but where it gets its bite is, uh, and, and where it, it gets its bite from you, for me, and me for you, or for others, uh, is that it taps into something that is already there. Some kind of uh, uh, existential attachment to this world. That's why the notion that, it, that's why, the, so for Deleuze, for example, he says we have to b restore belief in this world. People who, a lot of people who, wanna, who were Deleuzeans, they, that surprised them. Doesn't surprise me for a bit, because the, uh, the very experiences of time that we have are leading to disconnections of some notions of, of belonging. And so you have to restore belief in this world. So you're trying, so the, the, to me, the secret ingredient in your moral activity is that it taps into certain modes of care uh, in me and inspires me to move uh, in, a, in, a, in a, this direction or that direction. It elevates my activity and so forth. Uh, th that's explicit here. That's what an ethic of cultivation is. Uh, and so it's, a, it's an ethic of cultivation, not an ethic of derivation or command. It's not a juridical ethic. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, that, that if you kind of get away from the kind of neo-Kantian world, uh, that, uh, that, that this is not uh, a unique set of ideas. That's what I would say. It's not a unique set of ideas. But, uh, uh, but the academy wants derivation. Uh, and, and derivation means that you have to have incontestable starting points. But we don't have incontestable starting points. Uh, and that's, that's why the first chapter of this book is called Shock Therapy, Dramatization, and Practical Wisdom. Uh, it's, it's, it's trying to enter into a discourse with your kind of thinking and my kind of thinking, kind of making it go back and forth. But thanks, thanks for your point. Didier. Following a little bit that, uh, <coughs> what is the role of contingency in your thinking? I'm a little bit lost between the dialectical move and the dispersion. Um, at some point, you use the terminology, it's not risk, it's objective uncertainty. Yeah. And I suppose you referred to self organization and magmatic self organization with Cornelius Castoriadis also. So, what, uh, what contingency is there, and how you move from contingency to objective uncertainty? Okay. If you think about uh, that there's a contingency of things that runs deep, uh, in, a, in a kind of a Foucauldian sense and so forth, uh, and if you think that, that that experience of this element of contingency in things that runs deep, uh, is not simply uh, a, 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 a subjective assumption <coughs> applied to the world because we have limited information. 
then then you start to think that that there is a that that there are resonances in various at, at moments of disequilibrium in various uh, 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 open systems. Uh, so it could be in equilibrium for a while, and then for because of of a collision with another system, or for a variety of reasons, it could go into disequilibrium, and that's what I'm willing. Those resonances, the, that, those kinds of more radical uh, uh, vibrations and so forth, I'm going to call those moments of objective uncertainty because they they have they have bifurcations and they could head off in one or another direction, uh, and so. Uh, uh, when I think of contingency, I think that there are some modes of contingency that are because of our limits of information, and there are some modes of contingency that are real. And that's part of the philosophy of time is becoming. Some modes of contingency are real. Now, it's not always easy to see which. Uh, and and uh, so, so uh, I think that, um, that the... Uh, that the closest affinity here would be between uh, uh, Gilles Deleuze on time and Ilya Prigogine, yeah. who, who uh, kind of moves... Yeah. Exactly. Ilya Prigogine, who moves back and forth between uh, this notion, I'm, and I, I still got to keep thinking about this, but back and forth between this notion that, that it's an element of real chance, or it's, it's uh, at these moments of disequilibrium, or there are modes of resonant causality uh, that we uh, that that have uh, kind of unpredictability in them uh, for us, and I think he goes back and forth on that. I go back and forth on that, but it's the second one that I'm tempted by today. So that's why I said objective uncertainty. I can cross that out if you want, but uh, I cross that out. That word, I'd be happy to. But but uh, but that's a very good question. It's a very it's a it's a uh, to me it's. It's a critical question to this notion. If you think that we live in a world of becoming, where there are multiple tiers of chrono time uh, on different scales of, of, of kind of clock time interacting periodically with each other, you're no longer a dialectical materialist. You're no longer dialectical. Dialectics are gone. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, uh, but you might have. That's all I can say right now. But thank, thanks for your question. It's very, very pertinent to this kind of inquiry. Sure. Sitting next to McDillon, it was very interesting to see that you take God out of Hegel in the, t in the double way as decisional sovereignty, which is the controlling agency on the one hand, <coughs> and the guise that's the historical rationality and linearity. Uh, taking God out of Hegel, both in the sense of the decisional sovereignty as the controlling <coughs> agency, or the idea that there is a controlling yeah. agency, as well as the guise, which is the overarching historical linear rationality right. that runs through Hegel, out, and you end up with abstract machines which I can read, I'm not delusion, so I just read it as a radical form of thinking relationally. Things are interpenetrated, related, and so on, so next rest of the <coughs> And then I was a bit surprised in your answers, and tried to see that you actually still think change in terms of moving from equilibrium, so there is a st stabilizing element in terms of a system logic that you have an equilibrium, to a crisis which is outside of the equilibrium as disequilibrium. And I was wondering whether it doesn't make more sense if you do abstract machines in this highly interpenetrated world, to try to think change as continuously imminent to the machine, and how you would do that, rather than falling back on the equilibrium, disequilibrium. Thanks a lot. I define myself as a theorist of imminence. Uh, so I uh, and uh, what what I want is um, uh, at different moments and times, I want both of the things that you just said. Because I think I can uh, identify some points where there, where the where the uh, change is more imminent, and another, uh, other points where there are uh, in a, in a world of becoming with multiple tiers of chrono time, where 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 cosmic, you know, Kaufman's view is that uh, there were uh, 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 cosmic uh, energies uh, dropped some uh, 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 cellular forms on the on the on the face of the earth that made a difference to the origins of life. Those are so that's a that's a you know a long stretch of cosmic time affecting Earth time affecting species time affecting so forth. Uh, so sometimes the 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 threat to the the equilibrium comes from outside. Sometimes uh, the uh, the uh, sometimes it has more imminent and sometimes most often it's a mode of of, of intersection between them the ch the challenge and the uh, and, and and the response to it. 
So I want both of those things. Uh, and, and I think that the complexity theorists that I'm examining also want both of those things. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that, uh, that that's the th that is a, a kind of a theme of, of a thousand plateaus. But I see your point because your point is that abstract machines have a certain power of metamorphosis in them. They do. They have a, they have a certain uh, power of metamorphosis in them. Uh, and, and yet something can happen to an abstract machine from some place way outside of its... Uh, uh, it's 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 uh, <coughs> established pattern uh, that that could create a dramatic shock, could even overwhelm it, and so forth. So that so that uh, so that uh, capitalism is not capitalism is imminent to itself. But once you have the intersection between all of our thinking about time is going to change when people take climate change seriously. It's going to be a trigger. And once you have an intersection between capitalism and climate change, and then climate change and capitalism, you have two relatively independent systems, open systems, for a long time not having that much of an effect on each other, now, uh, now impeding, uh, imploding on each other. That's not the right word, but I know you know the right word. So, uh, so, that, uh, so I want both of those. And I, I appreciate your way of putting it because I think that that, uh, that uh, I think that Deleuze and Guattari definitely want both of those, and I feel like I feel that uh, uh, Prigogine does too, uh, uh, in in his uh, notion of what it is that brings a, a system, any system, in relative equilibrium into a certain kind of disequilibrium where there's a lot more oscillation, where there's a lot more objective uncertainty. Uh, Dylan. I'm tempted to say hello to our source today. <laughs> that's that's exactly what this is. And I buy into this uh, into this civic religion that he that he so inspirationally articulates. Um, and I'm, but I've been trying to I've been trying to find trying to point a purchase on you to get a kind of point of application on you. Um, not for the purpose of bringing you down, but for the purpose of articulating, I suppose, one of my own. Uh, uh, deep ambiguities and fears about my own interest in and commitment to that civic religion. I think I just got it right at the end. I finally got a question for you. And it would be, is there a strategic calculus of necessary killing in your civic religion? Does there have to be evil? Is that what you meant? Say that's that's a, that would be another way of putting it. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. I, 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 necessary killing. Uh, uh, I'm really a sissy boy, so that we should we should keep that in mind at all times. Uh, uh, so so uh, uh, and so by the way was uh, Zarathustra. Uh, and and uh, so now with respect to Zarathustra, uh, I'm, I'm just reading the most horrible reading of Zarathustra and Nietzsche is that that uh, eternal return means long cycles. And, and the next most horrible reading is that it only means a kind of an existential test. Uh, eternal return means time is becoming, a world of becoming. That's the way I read it. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, I would be happy if you said, hello, Zarathustra, he's a better writer and more interesting than that. Uh, the, uh, is there a strategic calculus of necessary violence? Uh, There may be, but I would resist it, uh, and not, uh, and, uh, and and not uh, and not and not uh, play it out in, in, until in, in, in the most extreme situational imperatives. Because because if you have this notion, you what you share with Sophocles is the idea that there are tragic possibilities in the world. You don't have to share a notion of tragic fate, but tragic possibilities where these where fateful conjunctions occur. Uh, and I do have that. I have a tragic vision of possibility. Uh, because I don't think I live and inhabit, nor do I think you do, a, a purposeful universe, a providential universe, nor do we inhabit a universe susceptible, readily susceptible to human mastery, the two modes of compensatory thinking that cover up result to uh, So. Um, so I, I definitely have to accept tragic possibility. Uh, that's absolutely indispensable. Uh, and but 
But the, 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 that's why, but the figures I like in Sophocles the most are the minor figures. And I'm, I mean, how do I know? But I think that Sophocles does too. Uh, it's not Oedipus, uh, it's not Antigone, it's not Creon, it's Haman. When he tries to stop the action and tries to work out a compromise before it's too fucking late. Because, because time, because you can stand on the razor's edge of time and if you cross the line then, then you have the, the, the strategic calculus of necessary violence. So Haman is the concealed hero. And so is uh, Oedipus when he gets old. I know James would say I'm getting older or something, but uh, 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 so is Oedipus when he, at, at Colonus. Uh, he's, he's a more noble character at Columbus because he's become a seer. He's gone blind. He's a seer now. Tiresias, those are the guys. They understand tragic possibility and they seek to avoid it before the strategic calculus of what you're calling necessary violence arises. So I don't know where I stand on the latter. Uh, I know that uh, that part of uh, holding to a uh, the notion of a world of becoming, the tragic possibility, is to try to intervene at ways, uh, uh, in, in ways before it's too late, because it can be too late. That can definitely happen. That's my best non-answer to your question, Nick. Greeks to the present. Everything's a fair game here. Um, I, I guess more a question of clarification, primarily uh, because you, well, not primarily, but possibly because you skipped over the section on sovereignty. Yeah, I did, paper. yeah. And um, I just want to ask a question about your claim that your argument is not necessarily an argument against sovereign state. And if we can accept that sovereignty exists in multiple forms and states represent one particular constellation of sovereignty that legitimates them as a locus of political authority, which structures not only state power but also global space, I'm wondering what the, what the definition of sovereignty is or how you understand state sovereignty within the context of the global, uh, the global resonance machine. So I see possibly three different responses, that state sovereignty remains the same, or sovereignty remains consolidated in states, and if so, I appreciate you elaborating on that, or sovereignty moves elsewhere in a, in a manner akin to Hart and Negri, where it goes maybe not to markets, but in your case to the machine. And if so, if you can elaborate what that kind of sovereignty is. Yeah. Or that states uh -oh. still have power, this is the third one, final one, states still have power, but we can no longer articulate that power through the lens of sovereignty, and if not, what would the way in which, what lenses or tools or categories would be used to understand their, um, their prominence, as you still think about the power? Yeah, well thanks. Um, so, <clears throat> it's all in that section. Uh, the, the, uh, so let's let's. Uh, I do think that there is now a. Uh, but, well, I, I think that uh, sovereignty is the the notion that people don't think can be disaggregated and must be disaggregated. I think that sovereignty is an essentially ambiguous practice. Uh, I, I think that uh, the history of the notion of sovereignty in in, in out of the societies of Christendom uh, comes out of a profound. Uh, tension between the notion of, uh, of God as, as promoting a purpose and God as the nominalist God of absolute power no matter what and that, that creates a certain legitimacy just by the act and I think that those, that those notions are, have been attached to sovereignty. Uh, so I think that sovereignty is something that circulates uh, and that it has layers and levels. And so I don't drop the word but I, I, but I, I kind of recompose the term. And, and so I do think there's a global dimension of sovereignty now, but that not everything has moved to the, to the global level. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I think that, that with all of that, then, then uh, the state practices of sovereignty have acquired uh, somewhat new characteristics. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and amongst them are that as the, as, as more things kind of exceed the, the reach of states, uh, 
and, and as they need to mobilize their populations, they're under pressure to mobilize their populations. I do agree with these themes that you have more than moved to disciplinary and controlled societies as the, uh, as the practices of sovereignty. They intensify while the, uh, while the, while the scope of, of uh, control uh, is, 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 in some cases, contracting. Uh, so I want to talk about sovereignty uh, as a... Uh, as a, I want to talk about sovereignty as something that circulates. So you can have uh, another d dimension of it. You can have positional sovereignty. Uh, I'm running up against the blank wall here. Uh, you, you, you can have uh, the positional sovereignty, uh, and let's say in the United States, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, but you can have uh, a period where uh, the Supreme Court makes rules about the Cherokee in in uh, southeastern United States, and the uh, the president and vigilante groups uh, 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 practice a sovereignty of final action, of of the, the nominalist sovereignty of no, and they and they and so th that's part of the ambiguity of sovereignty. Uh, you could have the positional sovereignty of of the uh, the gang of five justices who elected George W. Bush. Uh, as a positional sovereignty, and you can have people who acquiesce in it <coughs> instead of uh, uh, in, instead of stopping the highways with their trucks and cars, so that nothing can continue on. So that so that you you give priority to the sovereignty of counting votes. Uh, so sovereignty to me is, a, is an essentially ambiguous practice that, uh, at, with many levels of ambiguity in it and many sites, but it's not a dispensable term. I don't think of it as a dispensable term, and uh, um, I might I might come to think of it as a dispensable term. So one of the things I, I also want to think about is that uh, this is that uh, I want to think about the outside of sovereignty, because the, in the, in the Schmidtian tradition you almost get the idea that there's no outside to sovereignty, and in the Hegelian tradition in a different way you get that kind of that tendency. The world historical state is the final. Uh, but so I want to think about the about sovereign practices that have these different levels in them. Sorry, I'm going on too much. But this, uh, that have these different levels in them. At the same time, I want to come to terms, uh, kind of dramatically, with the outside of sovereignty. And this, these, uh, this global resonance machine is one of the things that ha that that creates a certain kind of inside and outside of sovereignty. Climate change is the outside of sovereignty. Uh, and in another sense, of course, you could say, well, if sovereignty is that which finally takes charge at this moment, then you could call those things <coughs> sovereignty at some at some point. I wouldn't I, I wouldn't at that point. I would kind of maybe the language would start to dissipate too much. But I, I I think but I think I'd probably agree with you on this. I think that that there are certain terms that people have wanted to kind of keep their unicity and simplicity. And uh, and, and if you can't keep that, then, then it's all gone. Just throw it out. And I don't want either one of those things. I want to show that sovereignty circulates, that it has multiple sites, uh, and that it has ambiguities. And that, that it's concentrated, in, uh, 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 that some of its practices are concentrated. So, uh, and I don't think it's a purely juridical notion. Yeah. It seems to me that for your theory, maybe even this current economic crisis, I know you said you hadn't fully flushed this out yet in really your, your work now, but that maybe this is almost a help in a way, it seems to me, for your theory, that to get this wake-up call, to get this you know, joining of capitalism and climate change, you almost needed something to, to shock us into realizing where, where we actually stand. And maybe living in a world where we've sort of been living, you know, living beyond our means in a sense. But then, do you think this is this is enough to kind of wake up the world and change us, get us out of this the, the negative resonance machine, moving towards this positive resonance machine now, or do we need a, a catastrophe of almost greater sort bring us to the edge before we can actually, you know, break out and shift to your new kind of your new paradigm, if I might call it that? I'm on your side. I I, I, I think, uh, but my uh, I think that it opens up possibility, but never certainty. There's that uh, you can have you can have uh, 
to, to the same kinds of shocking events. You can have uh, uh, a kind of a new mobilizations in, in these what I would think of these productive ways, and you can have fascist responses. But I do think it opens up possibility. Yeah, and 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 uh, and I think that that the role of uh, micropolitics that. In, in, Mike, this is another word for what I've talked about roles and stuff like that. It's another word for micropolitics. Micropolitics and macropolitics always require each other. Not just at the, not just within the locality or within the state, but also at the global level. They require each other. So the, these 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 kind of create risks and they also create possibilities. So you try to make something of the possibility. I mean, in a kind of a very uh, uh, more minor way, uh, the day that the financial markets uh, uh, collapsed, uh, and 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 the Bush regime had to kind of uh, uh, change some of its policies and things with respect to the kind of the. the was, this was supposed to be an abstract machine, the market that was self-equilibrating fully, uh, and so this that's just one abstract machine. But they they always thought there was only one abstract machine. There are hundreds of them, uh, and they all have these potentialities, and especially that one. Uh, so that so that the day that they uh, uh, that they had to take these actions, uh, it was that week that a larger constituency of especially white blue collar workers in America listened to Barack Obama. They listened, and they weren't just listening for the kind of the stage performances of different kinds of people. They were listening. There a lot of things were on the line, and there was the day. It, to me, there was a kind of a, a, a certain kind of a tipping point, where uh, the the strategies of uh, of Palin and uh, McCain uh, were uh, had a hollow ring to them, and this kind of calm guy, I, I know I'm very excitable guy myself, but this calm guy was kind of uh, uh, people were ready to listen. It was a, and it didn't it didn't have to end up that way because if they were ready to listen, and he didn't have things to say. So there, but it was a tipping point, and I think that there are a lot of tipping points, and I think that the current economic situation, and, and it is an aspiration of mine to understand how the derivatives work and have worked better, because I think the derivatives <coughs> uh, are uh, one of the abstract machines, and there are multiple abstract machines at, at multiple levels of complexity. The lava flows are not nearly as complicated as the, as the derivatives. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, and and, uh, uh, and and if we think about that, that there are, there could be multiple abstract machines, we'll think about the market better. We'll have a much better uh, relationship because the market, the whole idea was supposed to be that here's the state, and then here's the market. It is autonomously self-regulating, and the state demands you know agency control and so forth. It was a fundamental misreading of both. And and. Uh, uh, Neoliberalism needs to bite the dust. Uh, it, 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 it's a terrible, terribly weak theory, which plays into people's fantasies. Uh, so, uh, and, and so, so I want to think of markets as abstract machines. I want to think of derivatives, uh, but I'm not ready. I mean, I, I, I you know. Like a short. This is David Kim. You know, Bill. It seems to me that a lot of what you're talking about here uh, is kind of anxiety management. You know, so the responses to you know contingency, excess, tragic possibility. You know, what you do with tragic possibility has a lot to do with your moral psychology of how you respond to the moment of anxiety. You know, so it could be resentment, it could be uh, resorting to a, you know a fascist authority as opposed to a generative authority, right? And so you know, it, this 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 effort, this appeal to push toward molding or pushing your anxieties one way as opposed to another, right? I mean, to avoid cynicism, to, to find something more generally productive, that's the harder, that's the hard equation, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, well, okay, anxiety minus, I, I, I buy that short answer to the question, yeah. Uh, but, but also, kind of, as you're doing it, tapping into something that is to some extent already there. Uh, and so, so I'm not, a, I, I'm not a, a, a theorist of kind of like negative dialectics or, or, uh, 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 strong uh, amounts of primordial guilt and all that stuff. I, I think it easily, too easily, draws into these negative machines. So I'm not, I don't go that way. Uh, but, but, but I have to say, I know people who do go that way. Who, from my point of view, kind of surprise me in terms of uh, uh, joining in the agendas that I think are positive. And it's fine with me. 
uh, uh, if I'm opaque to them and they're opaque to me, it's fine. I don't care because it's assemblages that you construct anyway. It's not unities. So, so it's fine with me. And then I'll try to figure them out again. I'll say, how did that happen? And I'll say, you know what I think? I think that underneath that is a certain kind of attachment to existence that something about your masculinity makes you afraid. I'll, I'll, I'll go after them that way for some time when there's a, you know, at a later moment. <laughs> I guess we are almost done here. Huh? <laughs> we may cut this off shortly. And I'm only going to call on Mick if he doesn't ask another stump the chump question. Ah, uh, shit. <laughs> Go ahead. But this is just too good an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, yeah. when you've been dealing with the virtual Bill Connolly for too many years, okay. not, to not, to post, to not to be able to pose some of the questions that have troubled you along the way. So it is a bit of a, a pointed question. It's, to ask Bill, what's the difference between Zarathustra and Derrida, uh, between a tragic vision of possibility and the messianic? Is 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 the difference there the piety of Derrida, as well as the uh, as well as lack of the empirics of the sort that you've been providing? Derrida, in his early work, always wanted to be poised between Nietzsche and Levinas. That's where he wanted to be poised. Uh, I like that. Yeah. I like that. I, I like that that poising, and I think that 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 in his later work, he went in a in a different direction. But when he went in the different direction, he, he would sometimes run the risk of being immobilized. I worry about that as the Derridian risk, of being immobilized. But and when he wasn't immobilized, he took stances I agree with. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I uh, am, am much more oriented to the Zarathustrian orientation, but I have no... Uh, uh, I, I have a certain kind of uh, agonistic respect uh, for the uh, Derridian messianic orientation. It's not mine. Maybe he'll find something, you know, maybe somebody will show me it, that it is and so forth, but, but uh, this is exactly a level at which agonistic respect is fundamentally important to me. Uh, uh, because, because I'm not sure that, you know, I will forward these things and I'll advance them as far as I can and so forth, but I'm not sure that we can dredge into the depths of the anxiety attachment syndrome so fully that we know what the hell we're talking about with great confidence when we come out. And so, yeah, I have a, I have a priority, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, it's, and it's on that side of things. And I think that that side of things gets less a public hearing. So that makes me feel good that I want to I give it a public hearing. I, wanna, I want it out there so that, so that people have to, some people at least, might think about it, uh, but uh, there's no, uh, I don't see, uh, I agree with William James at this level. William James says, uh, you know, you may not accept my notion of a pluralistic universe where there's litter in the universe and everything. I do, I accept this notion of that. But you may not accept my notion of a pluralistic universe, uh, but you know what? Your notion of a block universe hasn't been proven either. So you're going to have to show some respect for this one, and that's the one I'm pushing. I agree. That's, uh, I agree with him on that. All right, well, um, I said in my intro one of the reasons why we were delighted to have um, William Conley here is uh, not simply to shake the last messages of the ISA meeting off of us, but to elevate our intellectual discussion, but also to show us the, um, what he calls the plural potentialities ahead that we're going to explore tomorrow. So I want to thank once more um, Bill Collins for coming. Great question.